Okay, I'm starting you. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. okay, good morning, good afternoon, a good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to this webinar on building open and transparent land information systems through a global alliance. This webinar is co-hosted by the Land Porter Foundation, the Global Data Barometer, the Open Data Charter, and the Open Government Partnership, and is organized within the framework of the OGP Working Week, which is running from 16 to 20 of May. As you may know, the Open Government Partnership is an organization working with governments to transform how they, they work to serve their citizens. So we thought that this was a nice um, opportunity to um, celebrate the work that the Lamport Foundation, the Global Data Barometer and the Open Data Charter have done over the past few years. And working together, uh, the intersection between open data and land governance uh, with, a, with a goal, with objective of making land data more accessible and open. So this is one of the main objectives of this webinar. The, another important objective is we want to take this opportunity to launch the Global Data Barometer Land Module, which is the culmination again of uh, almost two and a half years of collaboration and mutually reinforcing work with the, uh, with the Global Data Barometer team. Thank you for that. Um, you may know that the, land, the Global Data Barometer was launched last week on May 19, and the module uh, is, is a, a core part of the barometer. Nicholas will tell us a little bit more about that. Um, we also hear from um, Tommy on how the Lamporta Foundation has been scaling up uh, land state of land information um, research approach. Um, to assess country level information ecosystems and also the, the nexus with the open up guide on land governance, a practical tool that helps governments to collect and release land data. So the event uh, is an opportunity to explore and discuss how all these initiatives and tools fit with each other and reinforce um, each other and also contributed to a more open and transparent land information ecosystem that supports uh, land governance. So a few um, additional logistic, uh, logistical notes about the webinar before we start. Um, first of all, the webinar is, um, is organized as, a, as a, a dynamic conversation with, with the panelists with few round of uh, round of uh, questions. Um, the audience also has the opportunity to pose questions to the panelists. You can use the um, Q&A button, please, not the uh, chat for your questions. We will address all of them during the uh, last part of the webinar. The webinar is live stream, so in multiple platforms. And so you will receive the, the video recording. Um, in the next days, uh, please. Uh, we also um, is also um, live tweeting is also um, occurring. So please use um, the following hashtags: Open Golf Week and Land Module. If you want to contribute to your tweets. Um, finally, very importantly, the webinar uh, will have French, Spanish, and Portuguese interpretation please um, use the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen to access your language channel. Uh, if you want to follow the English channel, please um, enter the English channel. Okay, and now to our uh, panelists. We have a, an incredible um, set of uh, experts here today with us. Let me introduce them. Uh, Jessica Hico is a research officer at the Open Government Partnership, where she contributes to analysis on a variety of policy topics, including access to justice institutions, public accountability, and service delivery. She's interested in understanding when and how citizens hold governments, actors to account, 
And she also published a research on uh, patterns of rights litigations in Tanzania. Welcome, Jessica. Nicholas uh, Grossman is the research and data lead at the Global Data Barometer. Um, he was the lead um, on the collaboration between the uh, LAM Porter Foundation and the Global Data Barometer land, uh, um, to, to produce the LAM module. He's a sociologist and a journalist specializing in open data and GIS. Welcome, Nicholas Charlton Bayer. He works uh, for the Land Porter Foundation and is um, our land and data information management specialist. Um, he's also a specialist in land governance and administration and has a background in land surveying and information systems design. He's more than, he has more than 20 years of experience. Nati Carfi, Executive Director at the Open Data Charter. She leads the uh, ODC team and engaging with experts from governments, civil society organizations, academics, and the private sectors. So welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. Thank you also for the audience. To, uh, we are quite a numerous group today and we want to hear a little bit more from you. So before we start, please take a few seconds to um, respond to two questions. So the first poll is, which region are you based? Please take a few seconds and respond to the poll. So we, we, we will know where you are connecting from. All right, just one second. And Neil will um, share the poll, and so you will see the question on your screen. Please click, are you connecting from Africa, Asia, Central America, Europe? Why? Wow, wow. It, the audience is really diverse. We have the majority of People connecting from Africa, a big group from Europe and Central Asia, but also a good representation from uh, North, South and Central America and Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's really a, a, a big diverse group. Can you take a few seconds to respond the second, the second uh, poll? please, what sector do you represent? What is your affiliation? Are you government representative or representative of civil society, private sector, international organization, or work for university research center? Okay, good, good, great number of Academics, 30%, also from civil society, big group, but private sector representation is also very high. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was really nice to hear from you. And, and now let's go into the discussions. Really diverse audience. Thank you for connecting. Thank you for being with us today. So let's start the discussion. My first question goes to Nicolas. Well, the, the Global Data Barometer was launched last week, Nicolas, and we know that this, the, the Global Data Barometer represents a really a new important benchmark that provides insight into government data capability, availability, use across more than 100 countries. It's really an important uh, tool to measure access and, um, um, to data. It was supported by the International Development Research Center, the United Nations Population Fund, and numerous organizations, uh, regional and thematic partners that supported the development um, of the barometer, including Transparency International and also the government, Open Government Partnership. Can you tell us a little bit about the barometer and the, the launch and why the LAM module in particular is important uh, for your work and also, if you can share a little bit about the initial results uh, that derived from the Global Data Barometer Land Module. Over to you, Nicholas. 
Okay, thank you, Laura, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Very happy to be here. Uh, welcome, all of you. It's very nice to see people joining for, from all around the world. I, I'm Nicolas Grossman, as Laura introduced. I'm based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I've been working along with the Land Portal Foundation, developing the land model and leading the research and data sections of the Global Data Barometer. Talking about the recent launch of the Global Data Barometer, I have to say that we are really excited to have all this information out there. We have been working almost two years in developing the methodology, carry on the data collection phase, the data analysis. And now that all the data and information is out there, we feel that it's a new beginning because we can uh, share with everyone uh, what we have collected uh, along with more than 100 researchers uh, around the world in 109 countries. And everything, every result, every evidence is out there to be analyzed by, everywhere, by everyone. And we expect to have new findings and feedback because for all the study, we have more than 60,000 data points that are very useful to perform statistical analysis, but also to explore all the evidence and the qualitative information that we have. And it's open in our website in globaldatabarometer.org. You have the summarized results, and also we have an open data section where you can download everything that we have collected and analyzed in these previous months. And OK, there you will find a lot of more information on the context and the methodology of this survey that, as uh, Laura has mentioned, has the objective of tracking data governance, data availability, data capabilities, and data use and impact all around the world. I'm going uh, more precisely to the land module and how is this important, uh, having read where a lot of people of the audience come from, working with land issues. I think that we already know how important is land data to tackle a very wide variety of urgent issues, issues, and um, you know, like sustainable development, accountability, economic growth, migration, and so on. So, um, the main objective of the global data barometer is to track data for public good, and if we have that into consideration, land data could not be out of this survey. And um, but also. The global data barometer is uh, is the, the successor of the open data barometer, uh, and in the open data barometer, there was an indicator to track the availability of land ownership data sets. And we know during a lot of years, this was one of the worst performing indicators. That was one of the most hard to find data on land ownership, comparing with different other data sets. So along with uh, another uh, methodological update from the open data barometer to the global data barometer, methodological and conceptual, uh, it was include the apparition of these uh, thematic models. So, and we took this opportunity to, to build a land model to have thematic lenses to analyze land data. And here is where the collaboration with the land portal is very important because we together uh, start building the framework and to explore which topics could be covered. And well, to summarize this work, because I know we don't have a, a lot of time, first, uh, going to, to the indicators that we carry on. Firstly, we rethought the indicator that looked for land ownership data and made it a land tenure indicator to cover different land rights and different land tenure systems. And then it was added a new indicator that was tracking land use data, not only land tenure, but land use data open. And also we, we had an indicator to track the uses of land data to address gender and inclusion issues, to have a lot of information on how this data can be used for public good. And the last uh, minute or seconds of my intervention, I would like to share some main findings relating the, the land models. This is hard to summarize because there are a lot of variables inside the indicators and a lot of analysis that can be done from the data gathered by the global data barometer. Um, but 
just to mention the main ones, uh, you know, the land tenure data is still one of the data set most that is very hard to find all around the world. And uh, it performed uh, worse than the land use data. Land use data, yes, was one that was more easy to find uh, released by the government. 77 national researchers found some land use data in their countries and only 57 find some land tenure data. But besides the quantity, the quality of land use was, was much higher, for example. Um, but among the land use data set, 70 out of 77 were free of charge and uh, 44 were machine readable. Uh, while those on land tenure, only 30 were free of charge, you know, so that means that a lot of land tenure information has to be paid in the world, and only 21 were machine readable. So this is just a few uh, information that you can find from the GDB data. So we encourage and invite you to explore all the results and evidence in the globaldatabarometer.org website. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you for your this, this preliminary results. We know that this is a, the first edition of the Global Data Barometer, so um, new updates will come in the future. We are, well, of course, uh, uh, working um, in the land sector uh, for so many years. We are not surprised about these results. Uh, we know we know how how, how uh, difficult it is to find uh, data related to land. Tenure, no? and ownership in particular, open and accessible to citizens, um, and the importance of making this data open for public good. You stress a very important point there, and that's why we thought that building a, an alliance, you know, a, a coalition of organizations that join efforts and, and bring forth each other to really make this data more accessible and open was so important. Um, so. So we look forward to hearing a little bit more about the, the future development. But let me now um, shift to Tommy um, to tell us a little bit more about the Land Quality Foundation State of Land Information Research approach, which is very much uh, connected and, and linked to the Global Data Barometer Land Model. So, Tommy, what is the relationship between the Global Data Barometer Land Model and the Land Quality Foundation solid methodology? Can you tell us a little bit more about this research methodology and what it is, the objective, uh, what it, it hopes to accomplish, and what is the nexus and how they reinforce each other? Over to you, Tommy. Thank you, Laura. Um, I, I think it bears repeating that. The, the increasing sort of digitization of information, the use of the internet, and the growing demand for data transparency um, has contributed to this kind of exponential expansion of land information ecosystems. While the reality is that for land data in many parts of the world, uh, it is still pretty much um, fragmented, inaccessible, um, poorly managed, and, and generally unusable. And the solely seeks to address and identify um, these public sources of land data at the national level, at country level, and provide an overview of those sources for land data and information related activities uh, with a focus on, on government generated data and the government organizations who are primarily responsible for the functions of land um, administration. So it describes the current state of the art in a particular country context with regards to land data, and we also seek to outline the framework for data governance and describe the data resources um, across data categories that we've derived from, from the modern land administration theory. And these include land tenure, use, development, and land value, as well as other climate change data. So I think for us, the SOLI is intended as a tool that can be used by um, researchers by, by land practitioners and government agencies for any work that requires access to data and information. 
Also at the land portal, we like to use this tool to conduct a thorough open data compliance assessment, which may assist in strengthening the capacity and identify information providers who would like to make the information more discoverable on the web. In terms of the relationship between the GDB land module um, and the Land Portal Foundation, the methodology has been designed to be mutually reinforcing. So as Nicola said, during the development of the module, we work to refine the land module so that it seeks to understand the state of data on land around the world and contribute to the overall global data barometer assessment of data for the public good. While the solely provides a detailed overview of the state of the open land data at the country level, the, the land module can be seen as providing an overview of this land data at a global level. And while there's a wide range of um, sub-themes and data categories that might be covered, Nikolas already mentioned that the focus was specifically on land tenure and land use, which is also included as key data categories um, in the land administration theory and in the SOLI methodology, so that we have this alignment. And the additional element, which is also in the SOLI, uh, focuses here more specifically on how the data can be used to support gender and inclusivity, whereas in the SOLI we look more broadly, generally, at equity um, aspects. So the focus supports, I think, the open barom data barometer measures on, on land registers that has been extended into tenure, but maintains this kind of consistency with the solely uh, data categories. And the data sets in the land module captured, captured different aspects of availability and use, which in the solely we do the open data assessment, uh, which provides a greater level of detail. So the solely and the land module both seek to describe the current status of land data and information uh, in various degrees of detail. They provide a baseline um, for the implementation of open data initiatives. And I think this is where the Open Up Guide uh, becomes uh, a really important resource because the Open Up Guide um, can work to, to identify and work towards those countries and those data sets and organizations that might be right for opening up. And it provides us a pathway for not only assessing the state of openness, but a pathway to make data more open. I think we realized that while it's critical to understand the current situation with regards to land data, it was not enough to leave it there. And the ODC and the land portal therefore partnered to develop the open up guide for land governance to take that to the next level. Great, thank you for introducing the uh, state of land information research methodology, uh, Tommy and how it links with the Global Data Barometer land module where the, the, the data barometer is a global study that, that shows the comparative position of different countries, whereas the, the SOLI is more a national level tool that supports um, multi-stakeholder action to improve land governance data uh, systems. And we know very well that you know, it's the first uh, to really improve uh, land governance is what is not measured cannot be uh, addressed. So really the, the global data barometer and the SOLI uh, research methodology, they both have the focus on measuring what is the state of art of land data and where are the challenges, the gap, what can we do to address it? And we work very hard to align the strategies of both organizations because we know that Together we can accomplish much, much more. And now let me go to the third tool because here there was a lot of work also to align methodologies and, and strategies and to support uh, country level action and, and, and particularly to support the, the, main, the main stewards, the data stewards, not that are the government. And the, Tommy has already briefly introduced the open up guide. So this lead me to Nati. Um, and uh, give the floor to her, for her to explain what is the Open Up Guide overall focus. Why did you choose to work with the Land Portal Foundation on specifically on an Open Up Guide on land governance? So who are you targeting and why? Over to you, Nati. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks everybody who joined from all around the world. 
uh, more than happy to be here. Happy, happy Open Government Week to everybody. Um, let me take a step back and explain a little bit um, what the ODC, what the Open Data Charter is and how we developed the methodology for open up guides and then drill down in why we collaborated in this specific tool. So the Open Data Charter is a global initiative that works both with government and civil society organizations to promote and help design uh, and implement open data policies with a purpose. So uh, when open data policies first started, um, the, the idea behind the, the design and implementation of, of open data policies were uh, kind of publish and they will come. So governments started to um, put online open data portals and publishing any type of data set that they could just for the sake of it, like having uh, open data was the important thing. Um, and and what we found after a couple of years of, of, that, of that idea was that uh, data was not being used because it didn't serve a, a, a specific uh, purpose. Um, open data needed to be seen as a means towards another end. And that's when the Open Data Charter started promoting the publishing with a purpose idea. So understanding the public problem behind the design of the open data policy. So what are we trying to tackle uh, with open data being a means towards that creating that solution particip participatorily? Um, so that shift actually helped starting to promote thematic open data policies. So uh, in order to, to make bigger impacts, in order to create bigger communities, because we could bring in thematic experts that didn't see themselves as open data folks uh, or organizations, but they could definitely add value to the thematic conversation. Um, from that perspective of publishing with a purpose, the Open Data Charter started developing what it's now known as the Open Up Guides, which are um, thematic tools, practical tools uh, that actually address high value data sets in each of the themes uh, that, that they exist. So as of now, we have four Open Up Guides. The first one uh, being on anti-corruption, then we developed another one on agricultural data, we developed one on climate action and the fourth ones and, and last one for, for now is the, the one on land governance developed with the land portal. Uh, whenever we develop these types of tool, we always collaborate with um, thematic experts. Uh, we bring in kind of our, our knowledge of governmental open data policies and of course share the knowledge, the thematic knowledge that these other partners bring in. Um, and in this case, we, we approached the, the land portal and started this conversation because we knew this was a theme um, that, that uh, the broader open data and open government community was talking about. And, and these practical tools see, uh, have already proven to be sound in order to develop participatory strategies and, and manage expectations because everybody knows what types of data we're talking about. Um, so that with that in mind, that's how we, we started the conversation with Land Portal to create this tool. Um, all the open app guides and this one also, of course, uh, has in, in the back of, of their idea, the, um, the knowledge that there's a locked public value in the data that governments are not publishing. And whenever we promote and start publishing that data, uh, that public value can be unlocked and reduced uh, for the benefit of, of the citizens. Uh, so it's very important that we, when we implement these open up guides, we do it in a participatory way. It's not just government opening up data, it's also understanding the demand side, the open data community that exists whenever we are, uh, wherever we are implementing. Um, and uh, as I said, kind of the demand and the supply side. Um, and I'm gonna leave it there because I know I'm, I'm gonna have another opportunity to drill down a little bit more in what the open up guide, this specific open up guide means. Of course, of course. Thank you, thank you very much, Nati. We really appreciate the collaboration with the um, the open data charter and the open up guide and thank you for stressing also the fact that uh, opening up land data is really not enough and, and, and data is not a land in itself but is a means for solving important land uh, governance uh, issues and also uh, to, to really reiterate that uh, the data, uh, the government uh, is the main custodian of land data and government should serve their citizens, so data is a public good. 
and information it should be open because it is, is really a public good. Thank you for that. And let me now um, turn to Jessica, final panelist, uh, who represented the Open Government Partnership and uh, wanted to ask what is, the, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, land related uh, work of the Open Government Partnership? And um, can you tell us a little bit about the, um, rel the relationship between land data and political integrity, which I, I, I know that is one of the modules of the Global Data Barometer that you develop, um, land transparency and openness. Um, the floor is uh, yours, uh, Jessica. Great, thank you so much, Lara, and thank you to, um, for inviting me to be here. I'm, I'm excited to talk with, with all of you. Um, I'm really glad to be here to talk about the Open Up Guide and the Global Data Barometer as well, because these are these are really great tools. And I, and I think working um, using these tools and some of the tools we've developed are they're a great package to um, use to implement OGP commitments um, to highlight a little bit about um, what some of OGP's land commitments look like. Uh, we have we have quite a number of commitments that focus on on land management and administration, um, over a hundred. And in terms of what mechanisms these commitments are using, the vast majority are on transparency. Um, over seventy five percent of our land commitments focus on making information about land more transparent, and quite a significant subset of those deal with open data specifically. Um, and these are at both the national level and the local level as well. And I, I think I'll have, um, I'll talk a little bit more about our, our local program later on in the session. Um, but to, to think about the topics that these land commitments are covering and kind of the ends that they're seeking to address, um, there, there are several, and as we all know, um, the, the importance of this land information has implications for, you know, economic development, for human rights, for environmental sustainability. But, but one end that I just really want to highlight today also is this point um, that you mentioned, Laura, about um, political integrity. So this is something that we're, we're just starting to think about a bit more in connecting our, our work on anti-corruption to our work on land. And um, in the same way that, you know, corrupt political actors or other actors may use shell companies or other accounts to, to kind of hold and um, hide assets, we see the same thing happening with land, um, where without this information, uh, actors can, can hold uh, finances, can hold wealth in land, and, and that's a big uh, area where where we see the um, this corruption and and without data to track who is actually benefiting from the ownership of land, it's impossible to kind of to to parse through that and and to reduce um, the ability of, of wealthy actors to kind of um, to accumulate more and more. And so that's that's one thing that we're thinking more about about the goal of of opening land data for this specifically anti-corruption purpose. Um, and I think when we link the this land data also with data about um, public officials' assets with beneficial ownership data, these become a really powerful tool for um, for tackling corruption as well, in addition to you know to all these these other benefits that we're talking about today. Um, but I'll stop there for now because um, I know we're going to be able to talk a lot more. Thank you. This was great, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. It's really exciting to hear what the OGP is doing on land data, and so of course, in um, uh, your efforts to um, address existing um, uh, data gaps. We, we uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, of course, um, address the, the commitments. We are really looking forward to have a closer collaboration and see how the Oh, the other tools no, that have been developed here can really um, support your work and where possible synergies um, are. Thank you also for mentioning 
uh, the link to uh, transparency, anti-corruption, accountability, of course, is very important. Uh, open data really contributes to anti-corruption and transparency, although it's not really the final, um, as I said, is a tool towards uh, and not an end in itself. Uh, opening up data is also uh, useful for improving uh, land administration function. So we also need to look at, at data uh, in, in that way. You know, the, the government uh, itself needs uh, more uh, accessible and available data to carry their functions, the land administration functions. So we see that there are several goals. Let's go to the second round of questions. Thank you, your contributions were really great. Thank you. Nicholas, I want to go back to you now. I want to ask um, how the land module uh, relates to other things in the uh, global data barometer. Um, you want to refer again to the political integrity to other modules, please. Uh, you want to elaborate more about the link yeah. the modules and uh, whether there are some overlaps or synergies between different modules in the in the global data barometer. Over to you, Nicholas. Sure. Firstly, I would like to briefly uh, describe a part of the structure of the Global Data Barometer. And we have seven thematic modules, along with two core modules that assess data governance and capability at the country level. But these seven thematic modules, as we mentioned previously, uh, are what we call the thematic lenses to analyze data landscape uh, in a thematic field. Uh, of these seven thematic models, the, the biggest one, the one with the greatest amount of indicators is political integrity, which along with the public finance model, the public procurement and the company information, we can say that they are focused on power, money and accountability. And then we have uh, two urgent global issues uh, as our health and COVID and climate action. And we have the land model. Uh, we have talked about the relationship that land has with all uh, these topics. And I think that uh, Jessica has made a great uh, conceptual connection uh, between the land uh, data and political integrity data and how uh, this uh, is very important to have it connected together. But apart from these conceptual connections that we know that are really important, we try to translate translate this not only in the interaction between the models on the focus on the CDB, but also in some particular variables to track these, these connections between topics. Um, for example, in the indicator where we ask the researcher to find and to assess a land tenure data set, there is a sub-question, for example, that asks if there is information on legal persons holding rights. So this is uh, especially related with the company information model, but also with the, some of the political integrity indicators. And related to climate action, uh, we also, uh, in the land use uh, indicator, we ask if the land use data available has information on protected areas. Or also we see if there is uh, information in the, during the, the history, during the time, so it is useful to track land use changes. That is very important to uh, explore emissions. And also in the emissions indicator, we have some uh, questions that are related with land data. And specifically in the political integrity model, um, we have built uh, an indicator to assess the interoperability of the political integrity data sets relating the, between themselves, but also the political integrity data sets and in their interoperability with another uh, thematic indicators. For example, one of the questions is if the political integrity data and these uh, data sets are, for example, uh, public official assets, uh, lobby data sets, uh, political finance data sets, if these information is interoperable with land data, if there are common identifiers uh, to make analysis crossing this, this information and to make these, these connections that we, 
we have uh, sets to be very important uh, to tackle uh, issues as corruption, for example, and hiding assets, um, to convert this in practical uh, examples on how this can be done if there are common identifiers, if different data sets published by different agencies and managed by different agencies uh, in a government can be interoperable and better used for the public good. Great contribution. Thank you, Nicolas. Thank you for highlighting the importance of um, identifying um, data patterns no? and, and uh, uh, when you make data open, really open uh, and available and accessible to people, you open up uh, a myriad uh, of, of research opportunities no? and, and uh, observing patterns uh, across uh, data, you can easily um, discover new tendencies and trends. And thank you for uh, mentioning the um, the land use data patterns that, uh, of course, can uh, help us understand the emissions, but I would also add investments uh, in, in changing land use no? uh, over the time. And uh, thank you also for mentioning interoperability of data, which is uh, extremely important. And uh, this is one of the um, key um, uh, goals of the open data community. Um, 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 working towards making data interoperable. So data sets from managed you know, uh, by different organizations, agencies can really become um, interoperable so they can uh, be correlated um, um, and, uh, and can be worked with, uh, together with other data sets for uh, realizing new research opportunities. Really important uh, contribution. Thank you, Nicolas. And let me now go back to Tommy. And um, thank you for also will um, bring us more into a more in-depth um, understanding of the state of land information methodology and also how, how it has evolved um, over time and how you came to the decision to align the research methodology with the open up guide research methodology. Tommy. Oh, thank you. Um, I think the relationship and the alignment between the SOLI methodology and the open up guide can best be described by seeing it as two interrelated resources that has three components. The first component is the scoping of the, the information landscape in a country. And this is the first step of the SOLI. The second step is to perform an open data compliance assessment based on the findings of that information landscape scoping study. And this is the second part of the SOLI. And the third part is to try and identify targeted interventions um, that are based on the open data assessment and come up with some recommendations for improvement in information management practices. And this is really the part where the open up guide uh, comes to play. In other words, assessing that status quo and then asking the question, so how can we proceed forward? So the alignment um, in terms of this is that, you know, the, the, the land portal has been working on the SOLI methodology for a long time and partnered with ODC on developing the open up guide. And I think it was um, fairly organic to make sure that, that these instruments and resources are aligned, relate to one another, and build on the foundation that the land portal had already put down there for um, describing the state of land information at national level. We have made some refinements uh, from the earlier versions to put the focus on government data. And I've said previously that, um, you know, we don't want to burden government departments to collect data purely for the sake of contributing uh, to externally driven indicators that they might sometimes be disconnected from. But to ask the question, what are the functions that government agencies perform um, based on their duties and service delivery paradigms and in performing land administration functions? And this responds to the modern land administration theory um, by, by, by Mark and Williamson, et cetera, that have proposed that land administration 
is, is seen as the management of land and associated resources that actually respond to these global imperatives such as poverty reduction, uh, sustainable agriculture, sustainable settlements, uh, conflict management, and, and, and as Nicolas also managed, uh, uh, mentioned, things like climate change. So the data that we need for the good governance of land must now include data on the core land administration functions of tenure, use, value, and development. And I can add to that two more categories that we've identified, which is actually data on the legal and policy framework for land governance. Even though this tends to be mostly bibliographic data, um, the legal and policy information is a crucial source of, of information and data for land governance. And then also other land related data um, that, that contributes to sort of land and climate change uh, discussions. And for each one of these categories of data, um, key information types have been identified um, that is based on these primary functions and the ability of, of authorities to report and support these global indicators and global initiatives such as the, the SDGs. So it is completely aligned with that as well. And we've included these same categories in the open up guide to ensure that the methodology for the open up guide is thoroughly integrated and builds on to essentially establish a baseline. And the baseline that I think the SOLI and the land module helps to establish an understanding the land information ecosystem is what the open up guide can build upon to ask the question, okay, it's interesting, this is where we are. How do we go forward? How do we open up? What is suitable for opening up? Thank you, Tommy. Really great. <clears throat> you make it, um, you highlighted a very um, important uh, um, piece of work that has, uh, we know that has taken us uh, more than two years to develop, um, joining, bringing in uh, land data expertise on one end and open data expertise and the expertise of working with government that, that comes from the Open Data Charter. Um, Thank you for also for um, mentioning the, all the different uh, data categories that uh, and, and, uh, and why they're all important uh, to uh, take into account because uh, we know very well that land is a cross-cutting issue and therefore measuring uh, land issues uh, means uh, measuring really a variety of different um, data types. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and land data. So Nati, I will um, go back to you now. And um, so after uh, spending time in aligning um, the Land Portal Foundation research methodology and the Open Data Charter Open uh, Map Field Guides methodologies, we decided to start implementing this Open Map Guide on land governance in, um, in a specific country context. Um, how is it going? What, what are the major challenges? Do, we, do you recognize these challenges also in implementing other open up guides or is it something different um, doing for the land sector? Over to you, Nati. Thank you very much, Laura. And um, let me start the, the answer to this, to this question uh, but by saying that the, the open up guide specifically targets governmentally created data um, so that we promote that government publishes the data that they produce, understanding that data actually belongs to citizen. Uh, so governments are the kind of creators of this, of this data, the custodians of this data, but the data actually belongs uh, to, to citizens. Um, as we did with the other open up guides, it has always been important to test drive these tools um, live and, and understand their, their value, but also in, in the understanding, sorry for repeating the, the word, that, um, that the open up guides are not written on stones. So throughout these iterations, we can understand their value for, for uh, the broader open data and then community, make changes, add or take out certain data sets of, of the open up guide. So it is very important for us to do uh, these, these, types, these types of iterations after we have uh, at least the first uh, first version of the of the open up guides 
thanks to the collaboration with you and, and with the support from GIZ, we have been able to start implementing and test driving this specific open up, open up guide for land governance in Madagascar and Senegal at the same time, which is, uh, which is also very interesting because we can see similarities and of course differences uh, while implementing this. We have found uh, these, these uh, types of, of um, similarities and, 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 and challenges whenever we implement it in, in two countries at the same time. We did the same with the climate change open up guide we implemented in Chile and Uruguay. Of course, there were things that, that, uh, that were the same in both countries, but then of course, uh, context matters. Um, so let me tell you a little bit how, how that is going because it's still, uh, it's our, both our projects that are still running. Um, as Tommy said, we are exploring the, the four data types and then the land tenure, land value, land use and land development, but also understand, understanding the legal framework and, and the, the relationship with climate change data. Um, the legal framework, of course, allows us to understand which, which data should, should exist that doesn't exist uh, legally uh, and which data can be published or, or not. Uh, the implementation of the open up guide, just to give it, give you, give you an idea in, in like three minutes, has mainly three steps. Um, so the first step is kind of a mapping exercise. We map the existing data, um, the data ecosystem and the organizations, academia, civil society organizations, journalists, whoever it might be. Um, so it's both mapping of existing data of actors within the data ecosystem and key stakeholders. So also understanding which areas of government are actually the ones that are creating um, and, and, and uh, publishing or not this, this data. It is important to understand also and collaborate with government, which data exists, it's digitalized, but it's not published. Uh, so we try to understand, like have a, a picture of what's going on. We understand that data is more of a, um, more of a movie, it keeps evolving and changing, but we need to take that picture in order to uh, start to work with, with the stakeholders and understand better the demand side and what, what exists and what it was, doesn't exist. Um, with that mapping uh, phase uh, done, what we go through is the technical analysis of the data. So we try to understand uh, the standards that are being used, collect the metadata, like when when is it when was it published, when when, when will it be updated, uh, who is the main creator of this, that data, of the custodian of that data, and we actually try to give technical advice on how to open up uh, the data that is not open yet. So we go data set by by, by data set, trying to do this technical um, kind of advice, if you will. And uh, uh, after going through our uh, participatory prioritization process, because we want to tackle not only the supply side of data, but as I have said, and I will repeat, uh, it's the demand data of data, the demand side of data that is very important. Um, we create what we call a roadmap. So it's a roadmap to open up data. Uh, what we've done so far with all the open up guides, it's create a short term, mid term and long term uh, kind of roadmap because we know the project is gonna end eventually, uh, but we wanna leave uh, kind of activities for when we're not there collaborating with, with these stakeholders. Um, so we create this, this roadmap uh, based on, once again, the, map, the mapping exercise, the work we've done with stakeholders um, and, and the organizations from the demand side. Some of the challenges we've found so far, or, or one of some of the things that we, we can tell about the project is, um, there's limited land uh, tenure data online, and, and that is uh, and that is something that I think that the barometer also picked up. Uh, even when it's digitized, it's not published. Um, there's of course social and political concerns. So opening up land data should improve public sector administration, but there's still some uh, some like. Uh, background like they don't want to publish some certain things so we want to we want to keep that conversation going and create that um build those bridges in order to uh promote openness from within government um then we need to increase trust uh citizens and governments must trust the data and the intentions of opening up data um 
then the the idea that open data can be used to reduce inequity uh, and not to facilitate inequality uh, it's something that we're working with with the, the stakeholders um, we know that we already know that open data can actually build uh, and add value to governmental services and we need to work with with the governmental stakeholders to actually help them uh, create that added value while using their own data uh, to provoke to provide better services for the citizens um, then uh, in some in some of, of the cases uh, this work on, on land data kind of would be a, a, a key thematic open data policy that is not like there's not an open data na open data policy on a national level, so we need to um, also help out with uh, with capacity building to introduce the policies of collection, storage, stewardship, the publication and the use of, of data, um, and then also to improve the capacity uh, of of and the cap the cap capability sorry uh, of land governance uh, data to promote data-driven decision-making, uh, both for government and, uh, and the, the civil society or academia uh, area. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Nati. This is really comprehensive and let us understand how comprehensive not the open uh, guide approach is and also how important it is to also include a data literacy, you know, capacity building program um, and when you implement it, you know, and, and also um, not look narrowly look at one sector, but also uh, understand or, or all the, the, the data stakeholders, different data stakeholders within the specific countries or what role they play you know, within the ecosystem. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running a little bit out of time and we uh, are um, concluding now the second round of questions. So let me turn to Jessica and maybe Jessica, you can also um, um, drive us deeper into the uh, approach of the um, open government partnerships and how the, you are um, uh, uh, addressing the, the, the most important data uh, challenges and, and, and gaps um, um, within, um, within the, the OGP uh, work and how the, the, the OGP commitments are designed in a way that address these, these challenges and gaps. I condensed the two questions into one, so uh, with the hope of saving a little bit of time, I'll give you the floor uh, to you now, Jessica. Sure. So um, I guess just to, so first I'll describe some of the gaps and then I can tell you a little bit about how the commitments um, within OGP are doing. So um, to highlight this, I want to talk a little bit about what our team is doing with the data produced by the global data barometer. So it's really exciting because we can, we're using the data published by the global data barometer to understand where um, the gaps in each OGP member country are in terms of publishing land data. So we can see whether, um, where those gaps are, and then we can see whether their commitments are actually addressing those gaps or whether they're about something completely different. Um, and so we've been recently doing analysis. Part of our part of our uh, project is is looking at this land data, and um, what the data shows for OGP countries is that just under half of OGP countries have uh, some form of land data or information land tenure data or information available um, for free for public access. However, only a quarter of OGP members. Um, have this data available in an open, usable format. Um, and so, so really our goal here is to understand two things. One is what the gaps are in terms of data usability. The other is to understand what the gaps are in terms of what the data is covering. Um, and so in terms of data usability and availability, we know that you know making this data actually downloadable, machine readable. These are really big challenges, um, especially in the in the area of land management. Um, and then, in terms of topical challenges, in terms of the the um, I guess the scope of what the data is covering, um, we 
are missing key points. Most countries do not cover um, information about, um, as I was mentioning, uh, the beneficiaries of land tenure. So this is a really big gap for, for understanding um, and mapping political integrity. Um, we also see that uh, not too many countries publish information about the gender of, of land tenure holders, which is a big area um, for ensuring gender equality and, and, um, and human rights and sustainability. So there, there are definitely many, many gaps um, that where countries need to, need to uh, work more on both in improving the scope and improving the quality of the data. Um, luckily, OGP is a great, oh, okay, luckily OGP is a great mechanism for implementing, um, sorry, is there some, I think there might be some background noise, sorry. Um, the, there, it's a great mechanism for implementing these commitments. So what we know from understanding the data that, that we collect ourselves as OGP on the, on OGP commitments is that commitments about land and land administration are generally more ambitious. They have greater potential to, um, to transform the governance status quo than, than the average OGP commitment about another topic. And they also produce stronger results. Um, so uh, land commitments are, are more likely than the average commitment to, to transform governance um, on the ground and actually produce these results. Um, and so, so using the resources that we have from the Open Up Guide, from the Global Data Barometer, and then implementing through the vehicle of OGP is a, is a great way for, um, for countries to kind of move forward and make progress in this area. Um, so I hope I, I got all your questions answered there. Um, uh, but yes, happy to answer any follow-ups as well. Thank you, thank you. This, this was great, Jessica Burry. Um... Claire, thank you for um, making very clear the distinction between of the usability so data must be fair, no, findable, accessible, interoperable, usable, but also they should cover <laughs> all the range of uh, issues uh, that need to be addressed. No? And in particular, um, you highlighted the gender disaggregated data that we know very well that is a big, uh, is a big uh, challenge for the land sector. Uh, there are important campaigns uh, going on on this particular to address this particular issue and it's uh, and uh, also raise you know, uh, increase the awareness uh, of, of the data collectors to really have more data and more disaggregated uh, data because they are so important. I will go now very quickly into the third round of questions if you can please keep it very short so we can address a few questions from the audience. So first uh, to you, and, and this third round of questions, I wanted to ask you about um, the future. What is your next plans? Do you see any opportunity, new opportunity that arise from this conversation today to further collaborate, uh, further uh, improve the synergies between among our organizations and our work, um, the next steps. So first uh, uh, to you, Nicolas, so do you see, or what do you see as the next steps of the global data barometer or the, the land work in particular? Okay, we, we try to respond this in a few phrases. And um, first of all, I would like to, to bring here one of the main challenges that uh, uh, we had and some learned from the development and the implementation phase of the global data barometer that was building global indicators that were uh, relevant and useful in local context. Uh, we know that every land governance ecosystem is different. There are different contexts, different political, social cultures. So building uh, global indicators uh, that could uh, take into consideration all these particularities is a whole challenge. And here I think that it's this is connected with the next steps and plans and relationship with different organizations. For example, we can think about the SOLI methodology to explore these local particularities, along with the implementation of the open up guides uh, in different countries and see the results, and also to explore the OCP commitments and the mentions to land data in each of the countries. 
uh, to learn more about the how the local particularities of land governance can be reflected in global indicators that help us to collect useful data. And this useful data uh, is, I think, where we have to begin. The next step is analyzing very in a very detailed way uh, all the data collected by the Global Data Barometer to help and to promote uh, more open land data for everyone. Thank you so much, very concise and to the point. And now over to you, Tommy, for future plans, future commitments, uh, directions of the state of land information research work. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, I, th I think, you know, having done um, SOLIS in, 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 in four countries, in East Africa, in South Africa, and we are currently busy with um, Botswana, Malawi, Namibia, and Zambia, and I think also as part of the open up guide in Senegal and, and Madagascar, we will have quite a wealth of information um, at country level. And we're also expecting perhaps uh, to look at more countries in East Africa. So by the end of 2022, we could have completed solely studies in about 15 countries. And I think what would be very interesting is to start comparing those country level results and also comparing those country level results with the results from the land module um, to see what, what synergies, what, what can we learn uh, from, from this research and from this work and explore ways um, to further the collaboration with our partners um, and uh, to see how we can use these resource, resources to move towards uh, opening up more countries' uh, land data. We also hope that for these countries where SOLIS have been completed, there is an opportunity um, perhaps to consider the implementation of, of the open up guide where these benchmark studies have been done. And we also now have a global benchmark, which I think really sets the stage um, to talk about not only describing the status quo, but moving towards opening up. And I think that is, is really exciting for the way forward. Really exciting. Yeah, you're right, um, Tommy. And now, Nati, uh, to you, what are the next countries on your agenda for the Open Up Guides on land? And how can we really, you know, as, as Tom said, the link, uh, scale this up quickly, you know, because we know it takes a lot of time, long time to implement the Open Up Guide in a specific country. Uh, perhaps also linking it to the OGP commitments um, and the Global Data Barometer work. So yeah, we're hoping that events like this actually draw attention to the work that we've done and to the tool. And, um, and I invite anybody who's here listening about this work to reach out to us um, because we would be more than glad to be able to implement this, this open up guide in, in some other countries and, and um, in some other context. And what we've seen from, from the other open up guides that have a little bit more, more time now, um, is that the open up guides have been amazing in being kind of an umbrella to help co-creation processes from the open open government partnership. So there's already commitments that uh, use the open up guide on anti-corruption as a baseline, the open up guide on climate change as a baseline. And we hope in the future, we can see OGP commitments that are based on the open up guide on land governance. Um, as everyone understands the types of data and, and that, that, that will be up for discussion. The guides help manage the expectations and they have grounded conversations on what can be included in an OGP commitment and well, what cannot. Um, so we hope that, that these uh, new, if you will, open up guide would also be part of OGP co-creation process in the near future. Thank you, Nati. Jessica, will you also join this uh, pledge for um, more support to this uh, alliance uh, to make our land data more accessible and, and, and open and available. And do you see also synergies for collaboration um, with, with the initiatives that have been described here today? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think this is a great spot also to highlight our um, OGP local program, um, which has expanded a lot recently. And um, one of the, the areas where we're seeing already some commitments um, among these local government members is uh, land planning and participation in data openness and land planning. 
Um, and so in the next few months, we'll have, we're planning to put out a, um, some guidance on how local governments can consider um, making commitments in this area and, and what is feasible and doable at the local level. Um, and here, I also wanna say the open up guide will also be critical because one of the great things about it is that um, it actually itemizes out um, these the types of data that can be opened and then who are the key government actors who should be involved in that. And so I, I think that will be really helpful for, for um, OGP COPE creation processes to really think about who should be in the room um, when these commitments are being created. And then the last thing I'll highlight is also um, with the local program, uh, where our team is working on putting together a thematic peer exchange focused on land. Um, and so this will be a great place for government and civil society partners to come together to exchange ideas about these topics um, and, and really promote and, and galvanize commitments in, in this area. Um, so definitely a lot of, of places to collaborate in the future um, and, and really excited to, to be involved in this going forward. Great, thank you. Thank you for uh, this exciting discussion and, and the great commitments. Uh, um, so we, we still have about 20 minutes of time left. So let's try to address a few questions. I will pick up uh, three, three or four questions and then uh, you can decide which one you want to answer. Uh, are very, all the questions are really um, specific. So I will uh, read. Uh, few of them, and if you um, recognize to have some knowledge or expertise in this specific geographical area, feel free to address the question, okay? So the first one um, um, is anonymous. So there is an island in the Caribbean, which is called uh, Codring Guton, uh, Barbuda, which has no existing cadastral system. And this island was uh, severely impacted by a hurricane a few years ago. I've been trying to access the um, spatial image data sets for the island from the central government of Antigua, which is responsible for this uh, type of information, but uh, um, was not able to find, uh, to access this data set. So how, if this person is asking how uh, we can find, uh, um, acquire no, this, this data for, for for his land administration digital uh, prototype uh, working on the cadastro uh, for the island. So if anyone has any uh, knowledge about uh, Codrington and Barbuda, please uh, address the question. So the, the next one is for Nati. Has the open up guide for land governance taken into account the pastoral land, particularly in this area, um, where this, this issue is particularly important? And also it's asking if the guard is translated in other languages like French. Um, Nati just explained that we are implementing the guide in uh, Madagascar and Senegal. So yes, there is, is available in French. Amir is also asking, can a study such as the one that Jessica mentioned, um, can um, about a, um, can can be um, is is valid for um, the Caribbean um, area, um, and would she recommend um, inf well? And would they require information from the island government or local organization? This is not very clear. Um, in the context of internal and cross-border displacement, land data is critical in, um, in uh, uh, finding uh, durable solutions for uh, internal displacement uh, peoples and refugees. Um, so Jamal is asking whether there are existing tools, land tools supported by clear government mandates that capture uh, tenure information for affected um, internal displaced people communities? And how um, do we navigate land data capture, you know, particularly land uh, tenure data uh, in this very sensitive uh, context? So I stop here for now and wanted to ask whether 
any of the panelists want to address these specific questions, which are you can also find in the Q and A um, box before I address the following questions. Any of you? Some are really very specific. Tommy. Tommy, you are muted. Maybe I can speak to the issue of um, pastoral land rights in the Sahel, um, simply by saying that I think the, the Open Up Guide um, makes allowance for essentially any kind of tenure right. Um, the onus is, of course, on, on government or society or civil society or some organization documenting those rights, um, whether it's um, verbally, orally, whatever documentation. So I think the Open Up Guide is not a prescriptive guide in terms of recording rights, but it provides governments and, and organizations interested in opening up data with a methodology for how um, to distribute and make that data available. The underlying assumption is that such data is being recorded, that such records are being created. But the guide also asks the question about the gaps that exist. So it's also useful for understanding what data is not being recorded. And this could be an example where a key tenure right is not being recorded, is not being considered. And the guide can then help shine a light on that so that the governments and local actors can actually to help um, to capture such rights um, regarding land. Anyone else? Um, Lopa is also asking um, how a global land information system can address um, um, land markets uh, or um, uh, specifically targeting um, land used by indigenous communities. Um, so, and, and the fact that uh, government described some uh, this land you now that is used for uh, pastoralism or indigenous as um, yeah the, the 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 conflict of on the way this land is described you now by government and, and, the, and how it is de facto uh, used so it's, it's very of course it's very difficult to um, really have a um, a clear understanding you know, by looking only at the data that is available from, um, from the government. Well, I think one could answer the question by perhaps just saying that the, the, the open up guides provide that kind of transparency for land use systems and for describing land use systems and making that public so that if land are inappropriately described um, that can be brought to the attention of society and groups that are responsible for that because uh, I mentioned an example I was speaking to a forester once and, and he said that an unused forest um, would often be described by government as vacant or unused land and for him as a forester he sees it as the perfect use for forest land i.e the fact that there is no agriculture so I think what the Open Up Guide can assist with is trying to help make public this kind of descriptions, designations of land uses and allow that contestation of ideas and uses as a, in, in terms of what does unused mean and what does forest tenure mean and allow a discourse um, about that to take place. I think Nadi mentioned a couple of times that the Open Up Guide should be seen as a process and as a mechanism for allowing a conversation about land use and land rights to take place. And I think that's an important principle um, in, in terms of taking this kind of approach with the Open Up Guide. I can, I can try to answer and just give like a glance on, on kind of humanitarian data, which goes well beyond open data. And that's where we connect with kind of global initiatives um, the United Nations Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has launched uh, a, a while ago um, a 
what it's what is known as the humanitarian data exchange initiative initiative so there's specific rules of collecting and sharing that type of data in order to provide better um better responses to humanitarian crisis so as far as um displacement and and the, the question that addressed that i i would draw the attention to the ocha uh, platform because we're talking about a specific type of data and and specific needs that, that that type of data has that goes well beyond what the open up guide uh actually has like in 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 its core um so yes there's there's a a community working towards how to gather and manage that data properly, but it's not uh, it's not included in the, in the data sets that uh, the Open Up Guide actually tackles. So the office of um, the office of the United Nations, the coordination of humanitarian affairs, has this uh, HDX platform, which is humanitarian data exchange platform. I would I would recommend uh, the the person that uh, had that question to go and and, and find there all the the resources. Thank you, Nati. Um, yeah, these are very specific questions uh, for uh, land experts, really, and so uh, land data experts, uh, at least. So if any of you have any additional comments to add, um, there is also another very specific question. Um, let's suppose that a single land title is given to a village, you know, a cell in a rural community. This happens um, uh, in Africa sometimes. Well, it's, it's not very often, but it has started to happen. Um, so the, in this case, the title can be held in trust by the village uh, manager, management. So it's, it's managed by the village. Um, and uh, Loba is asking whether this address land-related uh, inequality, participation in decision-making. Um, of course, um, yeah, this is very specific <laughs> question, not very uh, data related, but uh, of course we know how, um, is, is one of the challenges that land registries need to uh, address, right? In, uh, documenting the land is uh, not being documented and specifically documenting the um, um, land is called by you know, groups or communities, and so not all the areas uh, are managed by individual owners, you know? um, but sometimes the uh, land is managed by um, an indigenous groups or a community, and, and sometimes you know, land registry need to be updated to reflect this uh, reality that for centuries has not really been um, um, documented properly. So, of course, this, this can become a data challenge. Um, um, and this is one of the biggest uh, challenges in the land sector. Not only the land registers being not up to date, sometimes there are um, overlapping tenure systems that are in conflict uh, you know, with each other. No? Um, so, uh, whether land is not properly documented and therefore for the government is, is free land that can be given, you, know, or you can invest uh, upon or um, uh, private versus uh, community land uh, rights um, uh, that enter into you know, uh, conflicting situation. Anyone has a comment about that? I can come in briefly on that. Um, just to say that, yes, this, this example that um, the, the um, audience member gave is a great one of, um, recognize, of the need to recognize these communal land tenure rights. And when that's documented, that's, a, you know, that's an important first step to ensuring that this land isn't grabbed by you know, a private company or used by the government for another purpose. Um, but I think to, to answer the second part of the question about uh, reducing inequality um, within communities, having this documentation is only one step towards that. And I think um, just to highlight, and I can point you towards resources on our website, um, we've had several commitment examples 
uh, where, where um, OGP members have um, made commitments to involve communities in land planning. And several of these have been very successful in actually allowing communities to negotiate with um, other, other actors who have interest in the land, whether that be the government, whether that be a mining company, um, what have you. And so creating these, these bodies of, of community members that actually have, um, you know, that, that actually have this negotiating power is also, you know, an important step towards um, ensuring this equality. So that I would say the documentation is one step and then um, to actually ensure equality within communities and between communities and other actors, this participation component is also really important. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers the question as well. Thank you, Jessica. Anyone else? And, and, and of course, uh, uh, in the land sector, um, Tommy can already mention that there are several um, organizations and initiatives that really uh, focus on uh, collecting uh, people-centered data, right? Uh, in, a, in a situation where there is no data, uh, uh, the government doesn't, uh, the, the land registry is really not documenting properly. Uh, there are several um, people-led initiatives that uh, take care of collecting um, data and documenting um, and ownership in, the, in different areas and then working with the government to get the data legitimized and recognized. Um, are you uh, expanding uh, open data in East Africa? This work of uh, this question is related to the fact whether, on, whether your initiative will also cover um, East Africa or is already covering East Africa? Well, I mean, I, I think we've, we've, we've laid a foundation in, in East Africa with the, with the SOLI um, providing a, a good baseline for the information. Uh, it is uh, some years old now uh, already, and that can be revised, but I do think um, certainly there is potential um, and also if there is, is interest. But, I mean, a lot of work has been done for, for East Africa and I know a lot more work uh, is still going to be done in East Africa. So I think there's definitely a potential um, for looking at that. And I think it's just worth noting that you know, the Open Up Guide uh, is not about establishing an open data portal, um, but is about documenting the existence of country level open data um, rather than collecting more data. So I think that's just uh, something to make, make clear. Thank you so much. Thank you for this great uh, discussion today uh, and all the important insights and the commitments uh, uh, towards more collaboration and synergy. Thank you for the questions from the audience. Um, please uh, remember to complete the brief um, survey that uh, comes after the uh, webinar. We are very much interested in your feedback and, and um, your comments um, and now let me just uh, go very quickly for 30 second final statement uh, from all, all the uh, panelists um, before we close. So uh, we want to start from you again, Nicholas, you have any final thought, any final remark, any final statements that you want the audience to be aware of. Yeah, as we have uh, find out and reinforced today, there is a long way uh, and a lot of work to do related to land uh, data uh, to improve openness and, and access. And I think that uh, through partnership and through uh, improving the local knowledge of the particularities, we are moving towards there. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, Tommy. Yeah, I think um, working together is the most important aspect and, and building trusts and building relationships and having these discussions. And I think today is just another um, step in this process. And I would like to encourage everybody that was um, at the webinar uh, to visit our website, um, to look for updates and to look for resources. And please feel free to contact us um, with any questions, queries um, or 
if you want to just get involved. Thank you. Thank you, um, Tommy, Nati. Your final. Just, yeah, encourage encourage everyone to reach out to us. As we say, we would like to implement the guide in different contexts to figure out how to uh, improve this tool over time. So just reach out to us, and I hope we see in the future OGP commitments based on on this open up guide. And Jessica. Yes, just to echo what Nati said, um, we definitely are hoping to see see more commitments come out of this collaboration um, and very excited looking forward to um, to being able to implement more of these commitments. And um, if any of the attendees here are interested in learning more about the open government partnership or getting involved in OGP processes, um, you can go to our website, opengovpartnership.org, and feel free to reach out with any questions about how to get involved. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you to our uh, audience to, for joining us today. For, we appreciate your participation, your engagement, and any questions. Feel free to get back to us. If you have any additional questions, sorry if we were not able to answer all your questions. Um, I reiterate here a few keywords that came from our panelists, partnerships, working together, collaboration, synergies, um, a really strong point that I want to uh, reiterate, building trust um, and um, to open up uh, land data for a better uh, land governance and, 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 and the land data ecosystem. Thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, feel free to go to our website, land portal, OGP, uh, open data charter, and the global data barometer and explore and uh, all the information and the data there. Thank you again and have a good rest of the day. Goodbye. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, thank you. Thank you.